Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming here after lunch. I almost don't see anything, so uh, maybe it's better. But uh, I hope that my presentation uh, will not disturb anyone who wants to take his afternoon nap. So uh, in my presentation, I will talk about speaker recognition and how we implement it in the Gong sales conversation intelligence system without interfering with the regular workflow of the user. In other words, uh, I will talk about speaker recognition without active enrollment. So uh, this is me. My name is Ram Machari. I work as a research engineer in a startup called Gong. And um, I am build a large-scale speech recognition system uh, as part of the uh, conversation intelligence platform of Gong uh, in order to analyze sales calls. So let me take you back uh, 20 years or more in order to get some perspective um, to, not to sales, but, hey, but um, to a, a related field, a close field, and see how this typical marketing meeting happened there. So we see here uh, very handsome people sitting in armchairs, smoking cigarettes, drinking a good whiskey, and using their dial phone. You see it uh, here, this dial phone. Um, and what they do is, uh, is trying to find the best ways to get to the hearts and minds of their uh, target audience. And at that, at that time, 20 or 30 years ago, um, this was, they, they were the masters of the art of marketing. So marketing was considered an art, something that was human uh, and not quantifiable too much. Uh, if we fast forward to today, to a typical marketing, we all know how it looks like. So maybe the cigarettes or the, uh, the whiskey remains with us, but the, the old phone does not. And instead, we get dashboards. Dashboards based on a lot of data and analytics. And uh, here we see an example dashboard where uh, you can see the results of uh, campaigns, marketing campaigns of uh, Facebook or Google ads, and uh, how they are distributed between different browsers, and what are the, the relevant pages, and so on. So we see that in the last 20 years or so, the marketing field was transformed from an art to data science. Now we see the same transformation happening today to sales. Uh, but again, let's first try to see what, are, what is our notion of sales or sales personality or sales person. We still think of it as an art, not as something too quantifiable. So if we look at uh, this scene from uh, The Wolf of Wall Street, we see Leonardo DiCaprio um, playing such a character of, of a salesperson who knows how to talk, how to negotiate, how to uh, persuade everybody to buy what he wants. Um, but, and, and, and in our case, we want to see if we can use data to help people to improve their sales skills. So instead of thinking that a salesperson is something that or sales personality or sales skill is something that you're born with or you will never have, we'll try to, to help with data. And indeed, uh, it seems that sales is quantifiable. So the bottom line, first of all, is very quantifiable. Every salesperson needs to sell. He has a quota. Oh, again. Um, and his, his paycheck it depends highly on, on the uh, amount of deals he is closing. And he knows how many deals he closed and how many deals he lost. And if you ask every sales manager or a VP of sales, he can tell you which of his representatives is the top sales, uh, or which are his top sales people and which are not, uh, just based on these, these uh, uh, bottom line numbers. But if you ask them why or what these top representatives do that others don't, then it's more difficult to, an to answer. And uh, the way to answer this, usually or uh, specifically when we, we talk about sales calls, is to uh, either join the calls, 
together with the sales representative, or here, recording of his calls. But this is not scalable, especially when you are a manager of, say, more than a few sales representatives. So, um, here comes conversation intelligence, or sales conversation intelligence. This is a new field, a new field that emerged in the last few years, and, um, and it aims to do to sales what marketing did. So, move or add data to sales. Use, move sales from art to be more data-centric. So how we do it uh, at Gong, I guess in other places too, uh, there are simple three steps. One is record the sales calls. The second one is transcribe them, so uh, to, to get the text that was said there. And the third one is, is analyze uh, the output of, of the transcription. So the analyze stage is the same in a way uh, to what was possible in marketing. And um, the last few years, or the last, let's say, 10 years, um, there were a lot of advances in artificial intelligence that enabled the transcribe stage to provide relevant information so that the analyst stage can provide meaningful insights so um, sales organizations and sales individuals can improve their performance. So let me try to provide some in some uh, examples of instances uh, that are coming from the analyst stage. Um, so, the first insight is uh, quite simple. Listening is more important than talking. Okay? So, what does that mean? It means that a good uh, salesperson listens more or listens enough and lets the other side talk. So, if we're looking at it um, from a uh, statistical point of view, we took about, we analyzed about uh, 2 million sales calls of uh, B2B customers. We have uh, several hundreds of B2B customers. And we see across the board, we see this pattern. We see that the star representatives, um, see them at the top here, uh, these are the, the salesperson that, that closed the most of the deals that, uh, that are the best ones. They talk about half the time, and they let the, the customer talk also half the time. Um, if we're looking at the bottom representative here, we see that they, talk, that they talk about three quarters of the time. So if we are looking uh, from the point of view of the customer, we see that the star representative are able to get the customer to talk almost twice than the other ones. This allows um, the, the, the calls, the sales call, to be much more efficient. Why? Because the star representative leads the customer. They want to, to ask the right questions. They need to, to, to lead him and to get the right information so they can uh, fit or just find the, fit, uh, the right fit of what they want to sell to the pain points of the customer. In order to do that, they need to have an efficient call. And in order to have an efficient call, they need the customer to talk enough. So this is what we see here, and you see it across the board. This is some kind of a uh, general statistics, and we can use it also as a best practice uh, when we recommend our customers what to do. Okay, now, the, what we saw earlier, the first uh, example was uh, some kind of a high-level statistic. Now, can we do something on the call level, on one call? So, on one call, what we show or what we, uh, we see is that uh, it's better to have a balanced call, balanced back and forth dialogue. So, other than, uh, it's called here coffee shop conversation, I don't know why, but um, uh, the, the idea is that we want to exchange information and we want to have the call to be, uh, uh, the call to be flowing. Uh, so, this is what a bad conversation or the conversation that should not look like. What we see here is that the salesperson has long monologues. You see the salesperson in blue has long monologues here uh, that are uninterrupted, and there's few back and forth switches between the salesperson and the prospect or the customer. Uh, and this is how 
a good or a better uh, sales conversation should look like. We see much more speaker switches uh, back and forth, and this allows more information exchange and more exchange of relevant information between the salesperson and the prospect. And we see the same pattern that top representatives, uh, the patterns of, of calls of top representatives behave more like this one than the earlier one. So these were examples of insights that a sales conversation or conversation intelligence system can output. Um, and, and these are actionable insights. People can be coached to talk better, to allow, to, to hear more, uh, and, and things like that. And, and the system allows also to monitor this. So, and there are other, uh, other insights, like uh, they're more, le more relevant to NLP, uh, and I'm not going to, to talk about them here. Um, okay, so as I said earlier, what enabled this, uh, this insight is the uh, progression in the transcription accuracy. Because of AI, because of introducing deep neural networks to speech recognition and to NLP. So, what do we do? Uh, what does Transcribe do, or what questions it answers? So, the first question I'm saying this first, although it is down below, it what was spoken? So, what were the words that were spoken across the the call? Um, usually we call that speech recognition or uh, automatic speech recognition or uh, speech to text. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about this now. Uh, the second uh, question that Transcribe answers is who spoke when? As we saw earlier, it is very important for us uh, in order to provide a reliable or actionable or relevant, meaningful insight, we need to provide the insight per speaker. So we need to separate when the um, sales representative talked and when the customer talked. So this is who spoke when. And who spoke when actually um, has two, uh, two stages. One is speaker diarization, and the other is speaker identification. Diarization is the process of separating one audio track to different speakers, or to, or to tracks of different speakers. What we do here is uh, look at uh, small chunks of audio and cluster them according to the audio characteristic. So at the end, we get, in, in this example, we can see uh, we start with the audio channel. One channel is not separated, and we separate it here, in this case, to three speakers. Uh, but in this case, the speakers are unknown. So we know that there are three speakers in, in the call, um, but we still don't know who they are. Now, the next step is speaker identification. Speaker identification means that we take the output of the former stage, these three uh, lines of speakers at the, at the top, and try to identify them or try to match them against known speakers. How we do that? Uh, what, what we usually have in our system is called metadata. Uh, usually, we take this metadata from uh, calendar information, for example, uh, the calendar invite to this call. The calendar invite usually has the information of who was the host of the call and who are the invitees. And usually, the host of the call is, um, is the, the sales representative or the salesperson that we want uh, to measure. Uh, so we prepare, we have usually a, a voice print of this sales representative, and we match this voice print to every one of these speaker lines above. And the one that best matches or the matches uh, uh, in good confidence, we identify him as, or in this case her, it's Taylor Greger, this is one of the sales representative of Gong. We uh, identify her uh, using this method. So um, now we drill down in another layer into speaker identification. Uh, speaker identification is uh, based on three steps. First one is training a universal breakpoint model, which uh, represents the speaker space, or representing, as you see here, all of the speakers in the world, or in the world that is interesting for us. Um, then the next stage is enrolling a voice print model for a specific speaker. And the third, space, third stage 
is identifying uh, unknown speech using the voice print model. Um, OK, so what, what does it mean to train a universal embankment model? As I said, it's, we need to learn the speaker space. And in order to, to learn the speaker space, uh, it was found that uh, we need to use recordings from thousands of speakers. Uh, so the, uh, the model will represent the speaker space. Um, uh, will be, and then this, uh, this is trained, uh, this is unsupervised training. Uh, so we get this uh, universal background model. And usually, this background model is based on a Gaussian mixture model, which is a mixture of Gaussian densities. Um, in order to represent this speaker space correctly, uh, we usually need thousands of Gaussians. And this leads to a model, a big model of millions of parameters. So this is the UBM, or universal background model. And we train it usually once, or uh, once a year, or something like that. Um, now, now, once we have this uh, background model, the model that represents the, speakers, the whole speaker space, we can uh, use it to create the voice print of a single speaker, of a known speaker. What we do is take uh, recordings of a known speaker. Uh, this is what we see here uh, as enrollment data of known speaker. And we see uh, which ones of the uh, Gaussians in the Gaussian mixture fit this model. So in this case, we see that the, the enrollment data fits the two top um, Gaussians. This illustration has only four Gaussians, while a regular UBM has 1,000, but uh, this way we can see it. So in this case, the enrollment data fits the two top Gaussians. And we use this data to fit, to fit the, the Gaussians, or actually move them in the direction of the enrollment data. So we get an adapted UBM, adapted model, that is more representative of this specific speaker. As you can see, the, the Gaussian mixture at the bottom did not change. Why they didn't change? Because they didn't fit the enrollment data, so there was no need to change them. And what it means is that these uh, Gaussians at the, at the bottom uh, probably represent other speakers and not this speaker. So actually, we can use this adapted UBM as the voice print model, but it has millions of parameters, so it's too big. And what was shown um, about eight years ago, six, eight, uh, six, seven, eight years ago, it was shown that it is possible to perform a dimensionality reduction to project the changes of the adapt adapted UBM to a low-dimensional vector. The resulting vector is what we call the voice print, or what we use for the voice print, or as the voice print. And uh, it is a, a significant reduction of parameters. So from the UBM that is uh, millions of parameters, we get uh, a vector of hundreds of parameters that we use as the voice print model. Now we have a voice print model of the known user. And we can use it to identify uh, unknown speech. So we have a, uh, a, a coming call. Um, for example, we see here a, a new call that comes in with two speakers at the bottom. We first don't know who the speakers are, so we call them speaker one and speaker two. Now we generate voice print or temporary voice print models for every one of these temporary speakers or these uh, gray speakers and match them against the voice print of the known speaker that we look here, that we're searching here. Uh, and again, we know which uh, person we are looking, because we have call met metadata, and we know who is, for example, the host of the call. So we try to see if one of these uh, speaker tracks matches uh, what the, the voice print model that we already have. Now, matching two uh, vectors, two voice print model vectors, results in similarity scores. Uh, we, could, um, we, we could match them directly, so use uh, cosine distance. But it was uh, shown that um, the voice print vector includes not only speaker information, but also channel information. This is problematic because our uh, customers talk from different different channels. So for example, one customer, the same customer, 
Um, the same user can call from a, a, a web conferencing and then call from his phone. So these are different channels, and we want to identify the same person in different channels. So there's a way to uh, do channel optimization or channel uh, compensation in the voice print space. Uh, uh, we do that. And then the result are scores. Uh, and as you, see, as you can see below, uh, we're using this uh, the scoring mechanism, we see that speaker one has higher score and enough score. And, and this is um, um, confident it's high enough. So we identify it as Taylor. OK. So um, now that we have a voice print model in our head, maybe it can encode more things. OK. Uh, so research showed that it, it encodes um, several things, the speaker identity, channel, all sorts of things, language. We can use it to, to detect the gender. Uh, these are examples of different kinds of voice prints. Some of them, uh, the most uh, relevant one or most used one today is iVector. This is what I uh, described. The other ones are uh, variants of using uh, deep neural networks that also show promising results in recent research. Uh, OK, so the problem is how to enroll a user voice without uh, asking him to, to utter or to say different um, phrases, like, for example, the, in Alexa. So one option is to ask him to tag, where, Taylor, where did you speak? So Taylor can say, I spoke, I was speaker one. OK, she selected. But that's not enough. How do you do it without any active enrollment of the user? So as, we, as I said, we have call metadata. And we can use it. So what we do is select the calls of a specific user using just the metadata. And then we take all of the speaker tracks from these calls, cluster them according to the similarity scores, and use the most similar speakers for enrolling the voice print model of the user that we, we are looking for. These have clear benefits. Uh, we don't need any user involvement, and we don't need to invest in uh, manual uh, labeling. Um, and here is a, an example of uh, speaker similarity matrix uh, coming from 10 calls, where each call has two speakers. And uh, we know that, uh, we, well, according to metadata, we know that uh, we selected these 10 calls because we know that um, according to a specific host that we're looking for, and we cluster them. Now, we see at the diagonal that the, um, um, when you compare the same speaker um, track to itself, it gets high similarity score, so it's orange. And you can also see that the clustering here uh, resulted in an uh, in, uh, orange cluster at, at the bottom right, so here which means that we have here nine speakers that are close to each other, and we can use them to build the voice print model of, of the user that we're looking for. Um, now, if we look at which clustering algorithms are relevant for this case, uh, it depends how, what, what, are, what are our beliefs. So if we believe that we have only two clusters and that's all we need, we can use k-means or agglomerative, agglomerative clustering. But if we don't, uh, if we cannot assume that, and if we try to cluster 10 or 20 speakers, that's, uh, we cannot assume that there are only two clusters, then uh, we can use the DB scan or density-based spatial clustering application with noise. That's another algorithm that is more uh, relevant for this case. And it's also robust to outliers. So if we uh, I can show you here an example of uh, how DB scan progresses on this uh, example of uh, uh, face, smiley face with pimples. So you see that it can detect quite nicely the, uh, the face, the round face, and actually three clusters here. Round face, mouth, two eyes, and ignores all of the other small outliers. So we can, we can see that uh, it just ignores the others, OK? Now, um, there are problems or challenges with this approach. The challenges with this approach are usually coming from the, the fact that we are now um, using this in the wild. 
And we, have, we, we try to uh, select this cause based on some kind of noisy beliefs. We believe that this host was in this call, but sometimes the host is not talking, and sometimes the speakers, some speakers have very short talk time, which is not relevant and cannot be used to, to create more a voice model. And sometimes there are more speakers in the call, and sometimes the diarization state, the first state that separates the speakers, uh, provides wrong results. So in order to do that, we can provide two solutions. One is improve the call selection by metadata by using more and more uh, um, information. And the other one is create some kind of a quality metric in order to filter out models that are wrong. So we create a model, and then we check if it's, it passes some kind of um, quality metric. Now, this is a good quality metric, or a quality metric of a good voice print model. We see that we have two clusters. We have the cluster of the speakers that we found that were most similar and they're close enough, the clusters are well separated, and the other speakers are uh, distinct enough. And these are uh, three cases of the opposite cases. So the, the first one is uh, the clusters are too close, so we cannot use them because we cannot know for sure which one is which. Um, and the, the bottom one is the speaker, the, the clusters are separated, but both clusters look the same. So, and so we don't know if the cluster at the left is the user and the cluster at the right is the customer or the opposite. So this quality metric needs to, be represent, needs to represent these cases and in order to, for us to filter out models that can be generated in, in this way. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the people that work on this, uh, in this project. Hanan is sitting here. Zor and Jonathan are also sitting here. And um, that's it. If there are any questions, I will be happy to, to answer. Is there any questions? Uh, okay, the question was when I cluster the calls, if I cluster, can, can you repeat it just? I didn't hear it quite well. Do you cluster each call first and then cluster the clusters? That was the heat diagram or do you cluster them all together? That's what I didn't understand from okay, that. Okay, we first, uh, we first perform diarization rhization, so separate uh, the calls to the uh, different tracks. And then for each track, uh, we try to cluster the, the whole tracks one against the other. So, yes. So, I have one. Um, okay. did you, do you have uh, uh, an idea of what's the minimum uh, required uh, uh, number of uh, calls you need to actually build a proper model for a speaker? That's the first question. And the second one is, uh, did you try using the uh, ASR information into the model? Okay, so the first question was um, how much information I need, or how many I mean, recordings, or how much time I need to, to pr create a reliable voice print model. So most of the research in this area is uh, geared towards uh, applications like uh, biometric uh, and, and there, you ask the speaker to say something, uh, some uh, tens of, of, of seconds or something like that. Uh, in our case, we have the benefit because we have uh, long calls. So we just take uh, calls of uh, tens of minutes and uh, we use them. We use almost an hour for, for creating such voice print models. But we can use less. So it's, it's a matter of how, m how much data you have. But we usually use uh, I, I would say about an hour for, for such a model. And the, the, the other question was? Using the ASR, the speech recognition, the text for the identification. Okay, so well, no, we, we don't use the, the text coming from the speech recognition uh, to aid uh, the uh, voice print. It, it is po it's a possibility. So there are distinct patterns that are different between the uh, customer and the salesperson. So th this is a, a, a good idea. We currently don't do it, but maybe later. Uh, but the opposite is true. So uh, good speaker separation helps the, the ASR process. Thank you very much. Thank you.